you've been with us for the last few months, you know that this has been a, a series of uh, sensitive topics, and we continue on with yet another sensitive topic today. This has been a series uh, where I've been preaching now for, this is the 10th uh, uh, week. Um, you're, you can see why I didn't let you know at the beginning how long this was going to go. Um, but this is the 10th week now that I've preached on these related topics of sex and marriage. And what does God say about it? And what did God say about these things, these um, features of human life that are the source of life, but also the source of such great pain for so many people and in so many situations. And as we've gone on over these last few months, we've talked, remember at the beginning, about the very foundation of what it is that we believe as Christians um, about God speaking, that he speaks at all, that he communicates at all to people to tell them what is true, what is good, what is right, um, and how things go. And that in the course of that, we've looked at how God does that through the Bible and how we can rest on the Bible and trust what the Bible has to say and interpret it Old and New Testaments. We talked about that. We've also talked about what marriage is and um, sex as God has created them both and defined them both. We've talked about deviations from them. Um, we've talked about uh, how uh, d various ways in which God's good and gracious plan for sexuality uh, can be misused and corrupted uh, and destroyed. We've also talked about uh, things about marriage as well. We've talked about singleness as a good thing, as, a, as another good part of life, every bit as good as marriage itself with its own unique um, special calling and purpose. And we've also talked then last week about how a marriage works, how a husband and wife are supposed to relate to one another. We're going to continue on with that topic today, but we're going to do it today taking the angle of looking at divorce. So when, as we've talked about uh, the ideals for what God has designed for us, we have to talk about these things uh, as we've already done so far in the series that we as human beings who don't live up to God's ideals, um, what happens when we don't live up to God's ideals? And what happens when the people around us don't live up to God's ideals? Um, even in this very passage that uh, Jack read, which um, I hope if you did not turn to it, I hope you do, in Mark chapter 10. It's the second uh, book of the New Testament. You can find it in your table of contents that way. Um, even, even in the course of that passage, Jesus talking about divorce refers to the problems for us as human beings, that we as human beings have this stubbornness within our hearts within our own hearts, within our own souls, the, these, this hard-heartedness that makes it difficult for us to live in the love that God designs for us to live. Now, I, I want you to understand very well that nobody wants to be divorced. Now, I understand that maybe there might be some people out there who take kind of a casual opinion toward divorce, but I've never met anybody like that. I don't think there are many people like that in, in my web of relationships or in my community. Everybody that I've ever met, everybody who's ever come to me to marry them or something, if I bring up divorce, they say, oh yeah, we're never getting divorced, man. You know, we don't want to get divorced. I mean, nobody wants to do that. And I understand that. I get that. I get that if there's anybody here, and I know there are people here who are divorced today, you're not divorced because you wanted to or because you thought this was a good idea. Okay, so I want you to understand that. And I also want you to understand that if you are divorced today or if you're on the brink of divorce or considering divorce or if your parents were divorced or whatever, that this message is not at all about blame. And it's not at all about kicking you while you're down. It's not at all about exposing weakness. It's not about um, treating you as, well, if you had only done better than this or that or this other thing. That's not what this is about. I don't think that's what the Word of God is about on this subject. What this is about today is three things. There's three things that I'm going to talk about. There's three things that God talks about that you and I need to know. We need to know, first of all, of what God thinks about divorce. Because God doesn't like it just like you don't like it. But the reasons that God doesn't like it might be somewhat different from your reasons. We're also, secondly, going to talk about what to do if divorce is a reality in your life. In other words, either your marriage is on the brink and divorce is coming or you're going through it, or... Um, you're already divorced and you're living in the aftermath. And you're like, well, now what do I do? What do I do now with my life? And the third thing we're going to talk about is how to prevent divorce. If you're married right now, what are the steps you can take to prevent divorce from happening? So those are the three things. What God thinks about divorce, what to do if divorce is a reality in your life, and how to prevent it. That's what we're going to be spending our time looking at today. So first of all, what does God think about divorce? 
As to start, I want to remind you of the definition of marriage that I've been using ever since the third message in this series, which of course is always, you can go back and catch previous messages that all of these are sort of built on. They're sort of stacked on the ones I've, been, I've preached before. This third one, um, you can find on our website, firstbaptisthpa.com slash sermons, or you can go to our YouTube channel and see that. But from the third message of this series, I've defined marriage as the whole person covenant that unites a man and a woman. Marriage is a whole person covenant that unites a man and a woman. Covenant, as we described, was contract plus relationship. Covenant is is certain duties and obligations that, that two parties make to one another, but not just as a sort of impersonal business deal, but in a relationship, in a genuine personal relationship with one another. And marriage is something that God creates where God himself, as we're going to see, unites a man and a woman. Takes two who are from different families and makes them one thing. I also want to remind you of some of the reasons why Christians believe what we believe about marriage. Through the course of this series, I've described five whys for the truth about sex and marriage. Not only the what of what God says and and what God says is good and bad, right and wrong, but also why we believe it and why he says it. And, And most of these are relevant here today. First, God loves you enough to speak through the Bible and we can understand it. So what I'm going to say today about divorce is assuming that God loves us, that God loves you, and he loves you enough to talk to you, not to just have you kind of guessing what he might think, but to actually communicate to you what's good for you and what's best for your life, and you can understand the Bible. You can read it, you can understand it. Specifically, we, as the Christian church together, as we approach it under the Holy Spirit's guidance, can understand it. Secondly, God invented sex and marriage for our good and for his. So God invented marriage. God defined it. This was not a thing that human beings came up with. This is not a thing that human beings came up with that we can alter at will. God defined it for our good as well as for his. He has a stake in this as well. Third, sex and marriage are for adults and for their children. Marriage is for us, but also for our kids. Marriage is for us, but also for our children. And both we and our children are affected by what it is that we do in marriage. And fourth, sex, marriage, and singleness are training for the real thing. We've talked about how there's a real thing out there. There's a real thing that's coming. There's a new age that has begun when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became human. And when he died on the cross and when he rose from the grave, in a new body, in a new form, in a new life, and when he ascended to heaven. And it's going to be complete when he comes back again in the future. And so everything that we're doing as people in our sexual relationships, in our marriage, and even in our singleness, if we're living single, is training and preparation and a sign and a symbol and a point, a marker, about the real thing that is coming. The real intimacy that is coming in the future. The real ultimate marriage that is out there between Christ and his church. We're going to talk about that some more here later. So everything that I say is based on these things, okay? So it's all based on these principles. So if these principles are wrong, then the thing that I'm going to tell you is wrong. If these principles are right, I believe that the things I'm going to tell you today are also right. Now the best place in the Bible to see what God wants you to know about divorce is this passage that that Jack read. Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 12. Now, in this situation, some Pharisees, these are uh, religious teachers in Jesus' day, are coming to Jesus, and they're asking him a question. They want to try to stump him. They want to they find out whether he is uh, legit or not, and they're also trying to wrap him into a debate within Judaism at that time. At that time, there was a debate within Judaism, even among these Pharisees, this particular sect, There was a rabbi who said that um, divorce is lawful for any reason. That if a husband, specifically looking at it from the perspective of a husband, that if a husband is dissatisfied with his wife for any reason, he can legitimately divorce her based on what is written in the law of Moses. There was another rabbi who said it is not legitimate for a husband to divorce his wife for just any and every reason, just any old reason. So they're coming to Jesus to get his own opinion, and to try to wrap him into this debate within, uh, within Judaism. 
And so Jesus says, what did Moses command you? And they pointed out, well, Moses said that you can get divorced. But then Jesus turns it around in an unexpected way. He says in verse 5, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. So he's saying that this law within the Old Testament that allowed for divorce to take place was a concession to human sin. It was a concession to the fact that human beings don't do what they're supposed to do. But it's not the way it's supposed to be. And so Jesus then says, here's how it's supposed to be. Before the fall, before our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God, rejected God, and went their own way, before they got their own bright ideas, before they went in their own direction, and before they plunged our entire race into ruin and death and under the subjection of evil spiritual powers and hostile relationships between one and another and hostility between uh, human beings and the earth and the corruption of all things and injustice and war and poverty and want, before all of that came into the picture, God's plan was this. And he quotes a passage that we've seen again and again and again and again in this series. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Jesus quotes it, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Now here's the kicker. This is key. Verse 9. Therefore, what God has joined together... Let man not separate. This is big. Look at this. Verse 9. Mark 10, verse 9. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Who joins a husband and a wife together? God joins a husband and a wife together. So, when a man and a woman go to the courthouse and fill out paperwork to get a marriage license, and then a marriage is performed, the state does not join man and woman together. When they come and walk down the aisle and stand before me, and I have them say some words to each other, I, the preacher, do not join man and woman together. And when they themselves are making those promises to one another, and putting rings on one another's fingers. They are not joining themselves together. God joins a man and a woman together. Yes, the state has a role in our country. Yes, the, the preacher has a role in our faith. Yes, the husband and wife, of course, have a role with one another as they're making covenant with one another. But the one who actually takes two and makes them one is the God who created human beings. The God who created humanity, male and female, that an amazing thing happens when these different human entities are doing their human thing, whether they are acknowledging the existence of God or not, or whatever God they happen to believe in. Silently, subtly, covertly, behind the scenes, God takes them and he makes them one. And because he makes them one, then anything that anyone does, including those two themselves, to say we're not one, is saying that God is not true. Is saying that God is not so. And the reason that Jesus takes such a hard line against divorce is because, number one, he's saying, we have no right to undo an act that God did. We have no right to say that the reality that God has made is not real. And number two, because what Jesus is saying is, we want to live according to God's original intent from the beginning. And not just the concession to our sinfulness in the present. Although we will talk a little bit about a concession that still exists in a little bit. Okay, So, so hang on. But the general principle, the general principle and especially for us believers, is that, again, sex and marriage and singleness are training for the real thing. We are living in the hope of a new age, a new era in which Eden before the fall is restored. 
in a new heavens and a new earth. And everything that we do and the whole way that we live, the love that we're supposed to show to, to God and to one another, all of that is about living according to the rules of a future era that is eternal and not living according to the rules of a present era that is fading away. We're going back to the future, as it were, to the new Eden on the other side of sin. And that's how Jesus wants us to live. And so he makes this, this bold claim. The disciples are so stunned by this. They can't believe it that, that when they go in private, his disciples ask him privately, like, okay, can you run this by us again? Like, what are you really saying here? And Jesus is very bold. Verses 11 and 12. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So in other words, if two people or if one person to the other person declares we are now no longer married, they are not for that reason no longer married. If the state declares they're no longer married, they are not for that reason no longer married. And therefore, if the person goes on and then marries someone else, in God's sight, they're still married to the original spouse and therefore they've just committed adultery. That's the basis for that. That's the reason for that. Now Jesus elaborates on this in another passage we want to look at, because he elaborates it and he also makes one very large and important exception to this very strict rule. And that's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. Now, I'm, I'm throwing it up here on the screen. In Matthew 5, 32, Jesus says, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now, there's some other nuances here in this verse to what we saw in Mark. First of all, Jesus elaborates to say that because a divorced person is still considered married by God, then if you marry that divorced person, you're committing adultery too. So it's not just that if I'm married and I divorce my spouse and I marry somebody else that I'm committing adultery, but the person that I marry, that second person, that person's committing adultery too because they're marrying somebody, me, who's actually connected in God's sight to somebody else. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that we're seeing here. A second thing is that the reason that Jesus says causes her to become an adulteress is because in his world, an unmarried woman, basic, especially without family to take her in, basically could not survive. I mean, could not eat. I mean, there, there, was, there was really no hope for her. And so Jesus, in this verse, is blasting men who divorce their wives because in doing that, they're forcing their ex-wives to choose between surviving and sinning by marrying again. In other words, they could either marry somebody, commit adultery in God's sight, and eat, or they could not marry somebody and not commit adultery in God's sight and stay pure and starve. And so Jesus is hammering away at men in his day for doing this and for putting their wives in this position. But the third thing and the most important thing I want you to see here is these words, except for marital unfaithfulness. Now this is a rather loose translation because the actual word there is a word that we've talked about many times in this last series, the Greek, except for pornea. You remember we've talked about this word pornea before. Pornea usually shows up in the New Testament as translated as sexual immorality or in older translations, fornication. We've talked about how pornea was a catch-all term meaning any out-of-bounds sex. And for Jews of Jesus' day, any sex that was not happening between a couple that was married to each other, a man and a woman married to each other, any sex outside of that was pornea. Any and all outside of that was pornea. Okay? That was all sexual immorality. And so that is the one exception to the rule. That is the one exception to the rule. Jesus is saying that, that if there is a situation in which pornea occurs that violates the marriage covenant, then, and only then, you have the freedom under God to walk away from that marriage and marry again without sinning. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to. You're not required to. You can stay in that marriage. You can, you can forgive. You can reconcile. You can put the pieces back together. Okay? I mean, maybe you can, maybe you can't, based on your situation. But, but, but that, is, that is a possibility for you. That is a choice that you can make. It also doesn't mean that if you do divorce and walk away, that that's necessarily the best move. That's a case by case. But it does mean that you have the right to do so. You have the right to do so. If your spouse violates the marriage bond sexually, 
you can walk away and marry again, and that is not sin. And I want to encourage you that if you're in that situation, if that has happened to you, I want to encourage you that God himself knows what that's like. Did you know this? God himself knows what this is like. See, you can read in Jeremiah chapter 3, and as always, I, I include extra scriptures in the insert in the bulletin for you to look up at home. You can read in Genesis chapter, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 3, about how God, uh, and this shows up frequently in the prophets, how God describes himself as being married to his people Israel. Married to his people Israel. But when his people Israel worshipped other gods, they were committing adultery against him. They were committing spiritual adultery. And we read in Jeremiah 3 about how God himself issued a divorce. He divorced Israel because of Israel's unfaithfulness and adultery to him. And, and what that means, my friends, is that God himself has had a wayward spouse who broke his heart. God got divorced. So God has been through what you've been through. If you've been through a divorce because your spouse was unfaithful to you, God personally knows your hurt. He's personally experienced it. He's personally been through it. He's had that happen to him too. Now, I should also point out that some Christians suggest that there's another exception in addition to adultery, and that is the case of desertion. A person just leaving, just abandoning, just walking away. Um, or, or another way of looking at that is just a unilateral decision to divorce by one spouse. And the reason that some Christians think this is because of something that Paul teaches about divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul writes, If the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. A believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. He's, he, the context, he's talking about a situation where there's, where there's a married couple, where one person in the couple is a believer in Christ, and the other person in the couple is not a believer in Christ. Okay? And their marriage breaks up. Okay? And, and Paul says, and this is important for us to see, um, you know, the, he's saying that, that in such a situation where there's a unilateral decision by one spouse, that, uh, that the, the spouse who wants to stay in the marriage, who wants to love, who wants to stick with it, who wants to make it work, nevertheless... It's, it's worthwhile um, to, to cooperate for the sake of peace and to let that go. Um, now, it, it means that at the very least, these words not bound, not bound, a man or woman is not bound in such circumstances, means that a person can submit to divorce with an adamant spouse without sinning. That if your spouse is insisting it's over, it's done, and you cooperate with that, you haven't sinned by doing that, okay? At the very least, that's what not bound means. And, and now, it doesn't mean that, that, um, that God doesn't want you to fight for your marriage, but it does mean that he doesn't want you to fight for your marriage, okay? Like, you know, it's one thing to struggle for your marriage, but it's another thing for the struggle for the marriage to actually become even more combative, and God doesn't want you to do that, okay? Um, and, and all Christians who take this verse seriously agree with that. But some Christians go further and say that the words not bound means that in God's sight, the relationship is then over, just like in the case of sexual immorality, and therefore you can go and marry again. But I don't think that's what it means, because I think that in the previous verses, Paul addresses this. Just a few verses before, Paul writes, To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. So I think this is the, this is the general standard, that, that if you're divorced, and it's not because of marital infidelity, it's not because of sexual immorality, that, that, the, that the move here is to remain unmarried or else be reconciled and be married again and work it out and, and be remarried to that person. Um, so... So therefore, I think that the, the direction here that, that God is giving, that Paul is giving, is that if divorce does happen, that unless that spouse, unless the divorce has happened because of sexual immorality, or unless that spouse then goes on and marries somebody else, or takes up with somebody else, and therefore demonstrates, well, they, they really are now, they themselves have committed adultery, that then um, you're supposed to remain unmarried, unless you can put it back together with that spouse. 
So those are the moral guidelines for divorce. This is what God lays out. This is what you're supposed to do. Because God makes two one, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. So that being the case, what do you actually do practically if divorce is a serious threat in your life? What do you actually do? How do you live? Well, first of all, let's talk about if your spouse is in Christ. And here's what I mean by that. If both you and your spouse have forsaken your sin, have acknowledged that you're sinners before a holy God, that you're under the judgment of death, and that you repent of your rebellion, and you go to God saying, I want to live for you now, I want, to, I, want to, I want a second chance, I want to live a new life, and I trust that Jesus is fully man and fully God, that he is the go-between, that he is the one through whom I can be forgiven, and I'm going to follow him now for the rest of my life, and I'm trusting that your Holy Spirit is going to make me alive within and is going to adopt me as your child and make me a part of your kingdom, and I am now tied with him so what's true of Jesus is true of me in your sight. That's what it means to be in Christ, to make that kind of commitment. That's what it means to be a Christian. So if you're a Christian, a real Christian, not just in name, but genuinely in heart, genuinely in spirit, genuinely in transformation of being born again from the inside out, if you're a Christian and your spouse is a Christian, then you need to remember, as your marriage is on the rocks, as you're fighting, as things are falling apart, you need to look at your spouse who's hurting you so bad and remind yourself, he is a son of God. She is a daughter of God. That's who I'm dealing with here. I'm not just dealing with this frustrating, angering person who's hurting me. I'm dealing with a son of God. I'm dealing with a daughter of God. And if your spouse is in Christ, then the part of that person that disgusts you, that aggravates you, that hurts you, is not the real him or her. That's the sin in the him or her that God is getting rid of that he's removing, that he is purging away, that he is throwing out. That's the part of him or her that's not still going to be in existence in the age to come. And likewise, when that person is mad at you, it's because there are some things with you that are not right, that are not perfect. Sin that is still in your life that's clawing at you. Temptation that you're trying to reject and resist as you're being transformed and formed more into the image of Christ. And that's not going to be part of you forever either. So you've got to love in the other person what's going to last forever. And be patient with the person about what is falling away. Husbands and wives who are believers need to commit to each other to help each other get rid of that junk. But at the same time, to be patient with each other while that junk goes away. Now if your spouse is not in Christ, then it's true that it is a lot harder to love your enemy. I mean, if your spouse is not in Christ, you're loving your enemy. The, you're, the person you're married to is your enemy. And you can't necessarily have that hope that, that there is anything in there that's going to last forever in the new heavens and the new earth. But keep in mind that the part of you that hates your enemy, the part of you that doesn't forgive your enemy, the part of you that doesn't love your enemy is a part of you that's, that's going away too. Because, see, God knows what it's like to love his enemy because he loves you. God knows what it's like to love his enemy because while we were still the enemies of God, he sent his son to die for us. God knows what it's like to have an unfaithful spouse. You are his unfaithful spouse. You are the one that he is bound to that he is redeemed, that he is called his own, who wanders back and forth every day between, yes, I'm loving you and serving you, and no, I'm doing it my way and serving myself. God knows what it's like to forgive the person who has hurt him so deeply and shows no evidence of changing because God has forgiven you. And you might think that you can't forgive. You might think you can't forgive like God because if you forgive, then you'll remain chained to a person who will just hurt you again. But in reality, forgiveness is the very thing that sets you free. Forgiveness doesn't let him or her off the hook. Forgiveness lets you off the hook. Forgiveness liberates you. Forgiveness isn't saying that what the other person does is okay. Forgiveness is saying that the truly wrong things that that person does are not going to determine your life are not going to determine your attitude, 
are not going to determine your behavior. That your life and your attitude and behavior are determined by things other than the sins that your spouse commits. Now you might say, but I don't love him. Or I don't love her. The great principle, the great truth is that you take the actions of love and the feelings will follow. You take the actions of love and the feelings will follow. You might say, I don't want to love because I don't feel like it. Well, if that's the case, you've got to dig deeper. You've got to find a deeper source of motivation than mere feelings. You've got to dig down to your core level likes and dislikes. Your core level loves and hates. For example, you've got to say, I want to be a loving person and spouse. And I hate the thought of being a selfish and unloving person and spouse. Or, I want to be a person who makes God happy by obeying Him. And I, don't, I hate the thought of doing something that makes God sad. Those are like core level loves and hates, core level likes and dislikes. And if those motivations are deeper than your feelings about your spouse, then you will actively love your spouse no matter how you feel about them. You've got to dig down. Even if you can't dig down to a point of saying, I really love my spouse, if you can dig down to a point of saying, I really love God, or I really detest the thought of being somebody who doesn't do what God says, let that be your motivation to take the actions of love, and then your feelings toward your spouse will change. And let me tell you something. Studies show that two-thirds of unhappy marriages will become happy within five years if people stay married and do not get divorced. Now, have you ever heard that statistic before? I mean, if, if not, which I hadn't until a few months ago, shouldn't we all know this? I mean, this is like one of the most important truths, I think, in the world. I mean, think about that. Of all the unhappy marriages in the world, two-thirds of them will actually literally be not just getting by, but genuinely happy in five years if they hang into it. Now, of course, one-third won't. But, it means we've got to dig deeper to obey God, and amazingly, good stuff can come out of that. Now, only God can create in you those motivations by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have those motivations way down deep, if you don't have way down deeper than your anger, your hatred, your hurt toward your spouse, if you don't have a deeper motivation of, I love God and I want to obey Him and I hate the thought of not obeying Him, you need to be saved. If you don't have those motivations deep down, you need to be saved. You need to get those motivations. Because if you don't have those motivations, then it means your basic core level orientation is anti-God. And if you're anti-God, then you're anti-life. And if you're anti-life, then your end result is eternal death. But God can save you. God sent His Son Jesus to save you. God offers you the Holy Spirit of Jesus to transform your motivations from the heart, from the head, to orient themselves to what His motivations for you ought to be. You can ask Him. You can go to Him. You can ask Him. You can say, Lord, save me. I don't want to be the way I am. Save me in Jesus' name. And He will. He will. Now, what do you do if you're already divorced? It, you, you can't say if you're already divorced. I, I've heard some people um, who, who have already been divorced, they've gone through the divorce, they get to the other side, they find somebody that they want to be with, they find somebody that they want to marry, and what they say is, my past is past. You know, my past is over. That, that, that last relationship, it's over and done, I'm moving forward into the future. Well, you can't say my past is past if your spouse did not commit adultery and is still unattached. Because in that case, your past is present. <laughs> you know, your past is present still now. It's still here. It's real. You can't just ignore what the Bible says in the name of, well, that was my past. You can't just say, well, I'm forgiven. It was, it was wrong maybe what I did, but I'm forgiven now. And so God has forgiven my sins and he's given me a clean slate so I can just move on as if that never happened. Well, of course you're forgiven. Your guilt is gone, but your spouse is not. Your old life of sin is dead, but your spouse is still living. You can't pretend 
that that's not so. You still have to, if in fact you are forgiven, if indeed your past is past, then living a new life means living a new life according to the word of God and according to what God says we're supposed to do. Not according to our own wishes. So now the third thing that I was going to talk about today and I am going to talk about is how do you prevent divorce? Okay? How do you prevent divorce? How do you keep divorce from happening in your marriage? Well, step one to preventing divorce is if you're not married yet, don't marry an, a person who's not a believer in Christ. Okay? Step one is don't marry an unbeliever. Okay? Paul says, again, in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. Now, this does not just apply to the case of a, a widow. It applies to anybody. Okay? If you are in the Lord, if you are with the Lord, if you belong to the Lord, only marry somebody who belongs to the Lord. And the reason for this actually should be fairly evident. I mean, I... This is not just some arbitrary rule. If you belong to the Lord, then your core identity is being united with Jesus Christ. And if your core identity is basically hostile to the core identity of another attractive person, your marriage will have a really hard time flying. It's hard enough for a marriage to fly with two engines that are pointed the same direction. But it's even harder for a marriage to fly with two engines pointed in different directions. Okay? That can rip the plane apart. All right? And if, if your core nature, if your core identity is, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you have been redeemed, if you have gone from death to life, if you have gone to, to a new spiritual identity, then if you don't have that in common at the root level of your life with somebody else, you're always going to have different aims in life. You're always going to have different goals in life. You're always going to have different directions. You're always going to have different values. You're always going to look at things in mutually incompatible ways. It's very, very difficult. Now, if you already have married the unbeliever, stick with the unbeliever. If the person's willing to stick with you. That's what Paul was saying there in the rest of what we saw in 1 Corinthians 7. He was saying, you know, if the person's willing to live with you, live with them. If the person's not willing to live with you because you're going in different directions spiritually, then, then cooperate with that, with that uh, marriage dissolving, you know. But, so stick with the person. But if you have a choice, definitely marry the believer. Marry the believer. Now, how do you prevent divorce once you're already married? Well, I think that what's critical is to realize that we human beings... As, as, as married people, we must love unconditionally. You've heard of unconditional love? This is familiar to you. You might have heard that phrase before. Okay. Unconditional love means I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what you do. I love you no matter what the situation, no matter what it is, I'm going to love you. And we must love one another unconditionally. But the truth is that while we're loving each other unconditionally, we're always going to love each other conditionally too. While we're loving each other unconditionally, in other words, I love you regardless of what you do, we're also going to love each other because of what you do. And actually, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. There's somebody in my life who's known me for some time, and, and this is a person that I'm absolutely convinced loves me unconditionally. In other words, I'm convinced that there is nothing that I could think, say, do, whatever that would stop this person from loving me. But I have no evidence whatsoever that this person loves me conditionally. In other words, there's no evidence that there's anything actually about me that this person, like, would honestly love me for. You know, that, like, they would actually say, like, I, I not only love you regardless of what you do, but I actually think it's really cool when you do this, or I'm really proud of you when you do that, or I love it when you do this other thing. You know, I, I really don't know whether this person loves me conditionally or not. Okay? And honestly, that's kind of an icky place to be because it's kind of icky being in a situation where you know that somebody loves you, but you can't tell that they really even like you necessarily, you know? So with us in our marriages, our marriages will thrive if we love each other unconditionally and conditionally. That I love you because I've, I'm committed to you, but I also love you because I think you're awesome. 
right? Like if, if both of those things are going on, the marriage will be healthy and the marriage will thrive, okay? So there, to, to help each other to do this, the, the, the principle, the mission that we have, the way we need to operate is on the one hand to love unconditionally while on the other hand making it easy for our spouse to love us conditionally. So in other words, I need to live in such a way that I love Kelly no matter what she does, but live in such a way to make it easy for her to love me for what I do. You see? I want to make it easy for her to love me for my behavior while I'm willing to love her regardless of her behavior. And if I'm doing that for her, that's going to change our marriage for the better all the time. It's going to always go up. It's always going to escalate. If I do that early enough in our marriage, then I'll prevent divorce. If I start doing this late while the wheels are already coming off, it may prevent divorce. It may not prevent divorce. But even if it doesn't prevent divorce, I have seen it. I can promise you on the other side of that divorce, I will be healthier and thriving than I possibly could have been if I didn't start trying to do the right thing while I was in the marriage that was falling apart. Now, I think the best author on this is a guy named Willard F. Harley. That's him right there with the mustache. Willard F. Harley. And his website is called marriagebuilders.com. Really great website, okay? Marriagebuilders.com. And he's written some books, and they're up there. Um, Love Busters is a book about preventing us from doing the things that royally tick our spouses off, okay? Um, and that become like, you know, time bombs ready to detonate that blow up our marriage. He Wins, She Wins is about, um, well, it's about what you think it's going to be, okay? It's, it's called, uh, the subtitle is um, The Art of Marital Negotiation. But the big one in the middle there, that's his most popular book, and that's the one of the three that I've actually read, okay? And that one is called His Needs, Her Needs, okay? His Needs, Her Needs. Now, now what Harley maintains in His Needs, Her Needs is that there are some basic needs that people have when they're in a marriage that they're expecting their spouse to deliver. And if their spouse delivers this, the marriage is going to be pretty happy and they're not going to be tempted to have an affair, okay? And what he's done in his, in his practice as a counselor is he's discovered 10 needs and five of them are typically husband needs and five of them are typically wife needs. And they're right here. The typical husband needs are on the left. The typical wife needs are on the right, okay? H typical husband needs are sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, attractive spouse, domestic support, and admiration. That's what a husband typically is expecting from his wife. And a typical wife needs are affection, conversation, honesty and openness, financial support, and family commitment. Now, there are, of course, exceptions where there, are, uh, where there would be a husband who his top five are four from the left and one from the right, or a wife where her top five are four from the right and one from the left, or three and two, or something like that. But generally speaking, they break down this way over and over and over and over and over again, regardless of the politics or theology or religion or whatever of the various couples. This just seems to be like core in men and women. And the thing that's weird about this then is that as you look at this, you can see the ones probably without even thinking very, really hard about it are the ones that are the real like high value ones for you. And when you think about caring for your spouse because those are the high value ones for you, those are the ones that you think, well, if I love my spouse, I want to deliver these high value ones to me, to my spouse. And when you deliver those to your spouse, your spouse says, well, thanks, that's nice. But it, does, but it doesn't deliver the bang that you're hoping that it's going to deliver because it's not the high value ones for your spouse. So what's key in marriage is learning how do I deliver to my spouse according to her needs, according to his needs, what's really important to that person. How do I do this? Okay. Now of these, there's two that I want to pick out that are especially sensitive and they're key to all the others. And those are attractive spouse and financial support. And I want to talk especially about those. And here's why I want to talk about those, okay? Here's why I think those are the most sensitive. It's because, first of all, they're perhaps the very first things that men and women notice about each other when they're sizing each other up and considering whether they want to explore if there's a romantic spark. Right away, very early on, singles, they're checking each other out. The woman immediately is noticing, is there going to be financial support here? The man is immediately noticing, is she attractive or not, okay? 
And so they're, they're very early indicators, but they don't go away after the two people get married. It's not like you get married and then, oh, well, good. Now we're married. I don't need to be attractive or I don't need to make money. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. The, the, the demand is still there after that. But these things are also highly sensitive, maybe the most sensitive items on the list, because what man doesn't want to be rich, or at least richer than he currently is? And what woman doesn't want to be gorgeous, or at least more physically attractive, or, or closer to the ideal of physical perfection than she currently is? I mean, of course, like if it was just easy to be an attractive spouse, or if it was just easy to have lots of money to be able to provide, we'd all be doing it. But it's not easy. And there's all kinds of things. As you look at this list, most of the things on these lists, if you take the right principles and apply those principles, you can make some serious headway. But for these attractive spouse and financial support things, you can take the right principles and you can try to put them into practice. And depending on how the circumstances fall, you might make no headway. You might not make any headway getting a better job. You might not make any headway losing weight. I mean, you might just be, boom, hitting a wall. And so what's the situation then? Where you're stuck. You're stuck in this situation where you can get bitter toward your spouse who wants you to be more beautiful or who wants you to be a higher earner and think it's just unfair and unreasonable and shallow and selfish for this person to expect this of me, to make these demands that I cannot fulfill. But the thing is, it is what it is and your spouse can't help it. And even if your spouse tells himself or herself over and over and over to just accept you as you are, they can't shut this off. If they could, they would but they can't. They might become more tolerant, but the turmoil inside them as a need is not getting met is not going to go away. So what are you going to do if your spouse is demanding something that he or she thinks that you aren't delivering? It's not a solution to dismiss their concerns is irrelevant. It's not a solution to get angry and resentful at putting their finger on your own sore spot. Those are roots to your spouse having an affair and destroying your marriage. Now let me make myself abundantly clear. There is zero justification for adultery ever. But the issue is, do you want to make it easier for your spouse to resist temptation or not? Now, if you're in that position where your spouse is making demands of you, your spouse has needs, and you're struggling to meet your spouse's needs, and you're failing to do that, let me tell you, you can have enormous hope because there is a great secret that I'm going to reveal to you today. And the secret is this. You ready? Here it is. Effort is more powerful than outcome. Effort is more powerful than outcome. Effort is the sexiest thing going in marriage. It really is. Effort is super duper powerful. Do you know why effort is so powerful? Because when I'm craving this need from my spouse, what I'm really craving is for my spouse to love me. That's what I'm really craving. That's what I really want. It's not about the attractive spouse. It's not about the financial support. It's not about any of these other things on the list. It's that I want to know that my spouse loves me, and when my spouse is like this, then I know that my spouse loves me. And if my spouse is trying, then I know that my spouse loves me. And if I know that my spouse loves me, the outcome is much less important. It really is. Apathy, neglect, that hurts. That makes me feel unloved. But if the person is trying their darndest, even if they fail, I know that I'm loved. And when I know that I'm loved, man, do I want to love in return. So don't get down on yourself with not being able to deliver the way you think you ought to. Do your best. He'll know you love her. Love him. She'll know you love her. Now, let's say you're in the other position. You're the person whose needs aren't being met. So what are you going to do about it? Pout? What are you going to do about it? Have an affair? I mean, really, those are dead-end streets. I mean, there, there's going to be no satisfaction there. And what is, I mean, did you really get married just to have a perfect person on retainer? You know, just to kind of deliver to you whenever and never change? Is that really all your marriage is for? Is that really all your marriage is about? Is your marriage just for being happy? Just for your individual happiness? Let me tell you something. If your marriage exists to make you happy, then it's a guarantee you're going to be miserable. But if your marriage is for something more, if it's for something beyond your contentment, then you have a shot at happiness. When Willard Harley started a singles group, 
to get singles to meet one another and to match up and wed, it failed. Then, when he had made a singles group where he told the singles that the focus is going to be not how do I find a person who will want me, but how do I serve someone else's needs, the success rate soared. Our default setting is selfishness. But when we change the setting to love, when we change the setting, it's not about my needs being met, it's about your needs being met, then the outcome is vastly different. I want to give you another resource for you to consider. This is one called Couple Checkup www.couplecheckup.com. This is an outstanding, neat thing. It's $35 a pop. You take a, each, each member of the couple, each spouse takes a, a questionnaire, writes it down. It spits out an objective list saying, these are the things that are going right in your marriage. These are the strengths to build on. Here are the growth areas, and here are some practical ways to address them. This is something Kelly and I did at this last year. We want to do it every year. Every year on our anniversary, take another checkup. Another basis for talking, another basis for building our marriage more. What God has joined together, he doesn't want us to separate. And his power is available to keep us from separating. His power is there. Because his power is available for us to love. Salvation is about the love that God has poured out into our hearts us pouring it out to others, including the stranger, including the enemy that lives in our own household, that shares our bed. God can enable you to do it. He can enable you to flourish. And if you've already suffered a divorce like he has, he can enable you to flourish again. Because see, God himself, his divorce to Israel didn't last forever. Because indeed, he sent his son Jesus Christ to win her back. And now the new Israel, those who believe in Jesus Christ, the church, are the new bride. And a wedding supper is happening. God's second marriage. God's remarriage to his wayward spouse. And they're going to love each other again, forever and ever. That can happen for you in this life, but it will happen for all of us who believe in Jesus in the life to come. I'd like you, when we're through, if you could take this card in your bulletin and uh, tear it in half. And there's one side of it that has our name on it as a church. And you can fill out something there that um, uh, is an indication of, of something, a decision that you need to make today. You can take this and put it in your pocket as a reminder uh, for the rest of this week of what you're going to do here with the Lord, the commitment that you've made to Him. And on the other side, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Please put your name and let us know that you're here. It's very helpful to us in our ministry in this church, very helpful to our administrative assistant, and very helpful to me. And, and any contact information we don't have for you. And on the flip side, if you'd write down anything there that you'd like to share with me, and you can take that part and leave that on your seat, and it'll be discreetly picked up afterwards, or you could put it in my hand afterwards. But right now, I'd like you to stand with me as I give the final blessing. Please stand. Please stand.